Now today, friends, we come to a book that perhaps if I use the best judgment that I've got, I probably would not even share it on the air, because this is a book that has been called a holy of holies of the Bible, and I think that it is just that. There are many ways of approaching this book. And may I say that actually it is not a story at all, it's a song. And you'll remember that this man Solomon was quite a songwriter as a writer of Proverbs and the book of Ecclesiastes. We are told over in 1 Kings, and I think probably I better turn there, it's the fourth chapter and verse 32, it says here that he, speaking of Solomon, he spake 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were a thousand and five. Now, that's quite interesting that he wrote 3,000 proverbs, and if you count them in the book of Proverbs and even include the book of Ecclesiastes, you come up with a great deal less than 3,000. So we have very few actually what Solomon wrote. We can say two things about them. The first is, we have the best that he wrote. Surely we'd have that. And then the second thing, we'd have those that the Spirit of God wanted us to have today. Then the strange thing is that he wrote a thousand and five songs. And that means he's quite a songwriter. He wrote quite a few songs Imagine a thousand. He could get on Tin Pan Alley any day with the number of songs that he wrote. And many of these songs, and we'll talk about that later, of course, we do not have. In fact, we generally say we only have one song. But I want to submit something to you that I feel is quite interesting. And that is that the number 1,005 is not a round number. Like 3,000 Proverbs, you'd think it'd say 1,000 songs and just maybe give us a round number. But the Word of God doesn't do that. We're told here that it's 1,005. Now, the very interesting thing is that the Song of Solomon is actually the book of Canticles. Now, Canticle is a little song. And it means that there are several songs here, several little songs that you have here. Now, there's a difference of opinion of how many that you have. Now, I think the old position was that there were five here. And I rather agree with that. Now, I notice the New Schofield Bible has 13. Now, how they get that, I do not know. But I do know that the New Schofield Bible is a very excellent Bible. But I would continue to accept the old division that it's five and that actually you have five of the songs of Solomon here in the Song of Solomon or the book of Canticles, little songs. And that there is, I think, a marvelous connection and a marvelous relationship that we have here. And I'm going to make that division as we go along in the book. But there are so many introductory matters that I want to give to you today in this little book, because this is a book that the average reader, who probably is going through the Bible the first time, he's puzzled when he comes to this. The carnal Christian will misunderstand and misinterpret this book. That's exactly what they do. And there have been different ways of interpreting the book. Origin and Jerome, they called it an allegory. And actually, I think it's an allegory of the church, a picture of the church, as we shall mention. But very candidly, I don't think that would exhaust it by any means. I think that what we have told here in song is really a very wonderful thing. And what you have in this epistle, therefore, is what Peter said concerning some of Paul's writings. In Second Peter 3.16, he said, "...and also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, 
which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other Scriptures, under their own destruction. And this little epistle, of course, has been greatly abused by carnal Christians. Now, the nation Israel, they would not permit it to be read by an Israelite until he was 30 years of age. Now, the reason for that is there was the danger of reading into it the salacious and the suggested, the vulgar and the voluptuous, the sensuous and sex into this. And very frankly, this is a wonderful picture of physical, human, wedded love. And it gives the answer, very frankly, to two groups of people today. One of those that hold to asceticism, that actually you're not to get married. And the other is that of lust. And both, I think this little book makes very clear, that are wrong. And it says that wedded love is a very wonderful thing and a very glorious thing. And I was advised by a retired minister not to preach on this until I was 60 years of age. And you know what I did? I turned right around and preached on it immediately. That's what a young preacher do. And I must confess, now that I'm past that 60, I think that qualifies me to at least, as far as the chronology is concerned, to be able to speak on it. But I must confess that it means more to me today than it did 40 years ago. And that the elaborate and vivid and striking and bold language that is here is to me today a very wonderful, glorious picture of our relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ And I know of no book that's going to draw you closer to him and be more personal than this little book will be. And when you compare it actually to other Oriental poetry, you get some of the Persian poetry. You think you're reading some modern poetry. You think that you're reading some of the dirty stuff that's being written today. Well, you find when you make that comparison, it's rather mild and restrained. Some have called it the Holy of Holies of the Old Testament. And therefore, not everyone is permitted inside its sacred enclosure. Here's where you're dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. And that's the reason I said at the beginning, I hesitate to give this on the air. And I trust today, if you're a carnal Christian, or if you're not a Christian, just tune this out and don't listen for the next few days. But if you're one that's walking with the Lord, and the Lord Jesus Christ means a great deal to you, and you love him, then this little book's going to mean a great deal to you. Now, what good purpose does this book serve? It's poetic and practical. And here you have God speaking to his people in poetic songs. I would think it would be just a regular song that you might hear that, gives a story, and there's a great deal of that type of music abroad today, and it's not on a very high level. And I'm sure that there are those that would classify this that way. Well, now let me mention some of the purposes of this, and that will help us, I think, to stand here at the very beginning of this book and recognize we need to take our spiritual shoes off of our feet. We're on holy ground. Now, first of all, it sets forth the glory of wedded love, marital bliss. When I see today the sexual freedom that we are seeing, and a great many people think that that's good, may I say to you that as one young fellow that was with this group believing in free love, believing in this matter of no marriage, not necessary, just living like animals, That's the thing he said to me. He said, for several years, I live like an animal. And he says, if you want to know the truth, I don't think sex meant any more to those of us in that group than it means to an animal. Couldn't mean very much. Therefore, today, this younger generation that is geared to sex 
and their lifestyle is just all of this sexual expression today. I'm of the opinion they know very little about it. All they know is what an animal knows. A dog out there on the street knows as much as they know about it. But we're missing something today. This little book teaches the sacredness of marriage. It reveals it as a divine institution. It shows what real love is. Here you have the heart of a satisfied husband and that of a devoted wife. This generation knows a great deal about sex, but it knows nothing about love. It's the Hollywood type of love and the hippie type of love today. Why, a boy or girl of 13 today knows more than their parents did. The very interesting thing, a father wanted to talk to his young boy about sex, and he beat around the bush about it, finally blurted out, He said, son, I'd like to talk to you about some of the facts of life. And the boy says, dad, what would you like to know? The boy knew more than his dad did. And we have a veteran movie queen with five husbands, but she doesn't know anything about real love because she committed suicide. And one that had someone that loved her would not do that. Modern novel and plays today. The heroes are neurotic, and the heroines have some sort of erotic condition, and the plots are tom-erotic, and you have the latest plays. No use for me to mention them. It's like taking a trip through the sewers of Paris. Then there is another purpose, not only to set forth the glory of wedded love, but it sets forth the love of Jehovah for Israel. That's not new, of course. The prophets mentioned that. The little book of Hosea dwells upon that. And to breach this matter of wedded love is the greatest sin in all the world, according to Hosea. And then there's another purpose here. It reveals the love of Christ for the church. What a beautiful picture we have here. And God uses human affection to convey to our dull minds and our dead hearts and our distorted affections and our diseased wills his so great love. And he uses the very best to arouse us to realize the wonderful love that he has for us today. This little book lets you enter into a marvelous, wonderful relationship that you probably have never known before. And you'll not be satisfied with all this gimmickry today that's going around. Folk taking this little course, and if they learn a few psychological gyrations, they'll be able to live better in the family. They'll be able to work out their problems. My friend, what is needed today is a knowledge of the Word of God and a personal relationship with Jesus Christ that very few of us are experiencing in this hour in which we live. Now you have here something else. You have here the love of Christ for the individual. And many great saints of God down through the years have experienced that. Paul knew something of that. He loved me and he gave himself for me, Paul could say. And then that was Samuel Rutherford. My, how he could spend a whole night in prayer, in a cold night. His wife would miss him. And during the night, she'd get up and go looking for him, find him, take his great big old overcoat and put it over him. And he'd never know she'd been there. And McCheney and Dwight L. Moody and many of these men came into a real personal relationship. Now, a great many people try to speak of this as an experience or a second experience and that we all need it. May I say to you, it's more than an experience. It's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, seeing really how wonderful he is, how glorious he is, and how he has a personal relationship with us today, and how you and I need to develop that. We need to come to the place where it can be true of us that we love him because he first loved us. This little book 
will break the alabaster box of ointment, and the fragrance of it will fill our lives, and I trust will spread out to others. Here you have actually a very wonderful picture given to us. It's given in the form of an antiphony. You have here several. You have a young bride. She's a Shulamite. We're going to tell her story next time. And then you have the daughters of Jerusalem. Then you have this Shulamite. She's the bride. And then the bridegroom. And there are wonderful exchanges of love and the hot passion, if you please. Now, friends, let me say this very carefully. And I come back to this because, oh, how people are being deluded today. They feel like that the Christian life is sort of like getting the instructions for putting together a toy that you buy at the five and ten cent store, only now you pay a dollar for those toys. I know because I buy them for my grandson. Things I could buy for a dime, I pay a dollar for today. And there always comes with this little truck that you put together, or this little house, this instructions. You take piece A and you put it down by piece B, and you take piece C then and you fit it in there. And I want to tell you that some of them are really complicated. You almost have to have a B.A. degree in order to put some of these little gadgets together. Now, a great many people think the Christian life is like that. That if you get together a little mixture of psychology, a little mixture of common sense, a little mixture of salesmanship, and a few verses of the Bible... That will be like a sugar coating over the pill. Then you take that, and you've really got it made. Oh, my friend, may I say to you today, that is not the solution to the problem. It's the personal relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. And today, we need a hot passion for Him. This cool, lukewarm condition that you find existing in the church and among so-called dedicated Christians. I'm a little weary, I don't know about you, of dedicated Christians. Some of them are as cold as a cucumber. Some of them are as unfriendly. And some of them are really arrogant in the attitude. We know something. We've got something. We belong to a little group. And our little group can do this. And our little group believes this. And you're more or less of an outsider. My friend, what we all need today is a real, living, burning passion for the person of Jesus Christ. This little book we're entering right now is going to tell us all about that. It's going to be personal. And, well, maybe if you have unsaved ears or those ears are not blood-tipped, maybe you better not listen to us the next few days. Well, I hope you do. Now, the way that it has been interpreted by many, and this comes largely out of the German rationalistic schools of the last century, when liberalism first crept in to the church, actually unbelief was what it was, they tried to say that what you have here, the Shulamite girl, was kidnapped by Solomon and that probably at first she did not want to go, and then finally she did. That, I'm sure, to a child of God that sees in it a wonderful relationship between Christ and the church, would not accept that. Rutherford and McCheney and Moody, this was their favorite book, you see. And they were the ones that could never accept that. And then the late Dr. Harry Ironside said that as he read these books on the Song of Solomon, that he could not accept that viewpoint, and he got down on his knees, and he asked God for an interpretation. Now, I'm going to pass on to you his interpretation. It's not mine. I make no claim to this at all. I give credit where credit is due, at least I try to. And I also have before me here 
a very wonderful book of A. Moody Stewart on the Song of Solomon. And he would not, of course, accept that viewpoint at all. And he finds in it a very wonderful spiritual meaning. So the interpretation, that is the basic story that is told here, and I think we need to have that before us, it would go something like this. We mentioned last time that you have here in this story the one speaking. It's an antiphony, the bride and the daughters of Jerusalem, and then the bridegroom and the bride. But you have here the Shulamite's family. And in the family, you have here several, I think, that we need to note. One would be the father, and by the way, he's dead. And there's the mother, and there are two daughters, and there are two or more sons. And the eldest daughter here was sort of a Cinderella. Here is her statement in verse 6 of the first chapter. Now, I'm going to lift out the story the best I can today for us. And then we're going to get in and see, beginning next time, its relationship to the believer and to the church. Now, here she says of herself, "'Look not upon me, because I'm black.'" Now, what does she mean by that? Well, she means she's sunburned, "'Because the sun hath looked upon me. My mother's children were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but mine own vineyard have I not kept.'" Now, what she says is simply this. This eldest daughter, you see, sort of a Cinderella. And she has been forced to keep the vineyards here. And apparently, this family lived in the hill country of Ephraim. And they were tenant farmers. We call them today croppers, or down south, and probably some of you would call us Okies, hillbillies. Not the Beverly hillbillies, but just real hillbillies, by the way. And the statement is made over in the 8th chapter, verse 11. Solomon had a vineyard at Baal Haman. He let out the vineyard unto keepers. Everyone for the fruit thereof was to bring a thousand pieces of silver. Now, this is one of the hillbilly families, the sharecroppers. And that's one of the places where the scene takes place. And this first scene here takes place there. And she is saying here, she says, I'm sunburned. Now, in that day, sunburn was a disgrace. It meant that you were a hard-working girl. And the women in the court, they wanted to keep a fair skin as much as they can. Now, here in California, they go down here on the beach and lie all day in order to get a sunburn. And it's not a disgrace today, but it's a disgrace if you don't have one. But in that day, it was a little different, you see. And so what you have here is this girl making this kind of a statement. She says here, I'm black and sunburned, and that I've been made to take care of a vineyard. But she says, mine own vineyard have I not kept. Now, what does she mean by that? She hadn't been to the beauty parlor. She hadn't been able to take care of her own beauty, you see. Actually, she was beautiful. But she hadn't been able to take care of herself. And she's really the outdoor girl, a hard-working girl. That's the picture. Her brothers made her not only do that, they made her take care of the sheep also. She says here, verse 8, If thou know not, O thou fairest among women, go thy way forth by the footsteps of the flock and feed thy kids beside the shepherd's tent. They not only made her do that, they made her take care of the sheep. Now... In her daily chores, she was on a caravan route there in the hill country. And if any of you have ever been through that area, you know how rugged it is. And there is a bus that goes up through there today. And all the tours that go to that land, not all of them, but most of them go up through that area. I've been up through there twice. And it's a rugged country. And I have pictures I took of Arab girls working in the fields there. Well, this girl, she worked in the vineyard. It's a great country for raising grapes. And she also took care of the sheep. Now, she was on the caravan route, and she saw the caravans pass by between Jerusalem and Damascus. They went through that area. 
And when she saw them, you get her reaction over in the third chapter, verse 6. Who is this that cometh out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all powders of the merchant? Well, who is it? It's a camel caravan. And on it are the beautiful ladies of the court, the ones that don't have a sunburn. They've got a panoply over them as they traveled in that day on camels or on elephants also. And these beautiful ladies wore jewels and had satins on. And this girl saw them. And she never had anything like that. And she dreamed about that, you know. And the perfume like frankincense and myrrh that was there. We're going to see, friends, what a wonderful picture that is of the Lord Jesus in both his birth and his death. They brought him myrrh when he was born. And when he was dead, they brought myrrh to put on his body. (laughs) Oh, there's so much that is so spiritual here and so wonderful. It'll draw you to the person of Christ. Well, here's this girl. And one day while she's tending her sheep, a handsome shepherd appears. And he fell in love with her. And it's a picture, and I ought not to run ahead and say this, but it's going to be a picture of Christ and the church. And this is what he said. He says, As the lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. Christ loved the church, gave himself to it. And he says here, Behold, thou art fair, my love. This is four one. Behold, thou art fair. Thou hast dove's eyes within thy locks. Thy hair is a flock of goats that appear from Mount Gilead. Beautiful, poetic language. And then you have, actually, this is a picture of Christ's love for the church. Christ loved the church, gave himself for it. Now, finally, she gave him her heart. And here in the second chapter, verse 3 Listen to her, as the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. Now, when the word love is used, it's speaking of the bride. He's speaking of the bride. When it's beloved, she's speaking of him. So is my beloved among the sons. I sat down under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet in my taste. He said, Come unto me, all ye that labor. Heavy laden, I'll rest you. Do you know what it is today, friend, really to rest in Jesus Christ? Is he a reality to you today? Do you rest in him? Oh, how wonderful this could become to you. We're not talking about religion now. We're not talking about an organization. We're talking about a personal relation, a love relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, After she gave her heart to him, they were madly in love. And there's nothing quite like marital love like that, where it says in chapter 2, verse 16, My beloved is mine, and I am his. He feedeth among the lilies. How wonderful. And that means that there is that wonderful personal relationship. And we find that he actually... Took her to dinner one time, <laughs> apparently as he traveled through the country. And all she knew of him is a shepherd, but he was a very prominent shepherd, it was evident. And in verse 4, chapter 2, it says, He brought me to the banqueting house. His banner over me was love. Took her to dinner, you see. Now, he's a most peculiar shepherd. He didn't really have any sheep that she could see, the other sheep were not of this pasture, you see. But she couldn't see those sheep. And she asked the question back in chapter 1, verse 7, Tell me, O thou whom my soul loveth, where thou feedest, where thou makest thy flock to rest at noon. Where are your sheep? He's an unusual shepherd here. And one day he announced he was going away. And he said he would return. He said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. Well, the days passed, and she waited. And finally, her family and friends 
began to ridicule her. They said, you're just a simple country girl taken in by him. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days these scoffers, saying, where is the sign of his coming? But she trusted him. She loved him. She dreamed of him. And you have a dream mentioned here. By night in my bed I sought him whom my soul loved. I sought him, but I found him not. Chapter 3, verse 1. Now, let me ask you a very personal question today. It's so personal that maybe you and I, neither one ought to answer it. And it's this. Do you really miss Christ? Do you long for him? Well, let's move on. One night she lay restless upon the couch, and there was a fragrance in the room. And it was a custom in that day that a lover would go, and there was always an opening where you reached in and took the handle, and the lover would put some myrrh or frankincense, some perfume in there. And so she smelt the perfume. In verse 5, chapter 5, she says, I rose up to open to my beloved, and my hands dropped with myrrh, and my fingers with sweet-smelling myrrh upon the handles of the lock. You see, she knew he'd been there. <laughs> she knew that he really hadn't forgotten and do you have evidences in your life of the fragrance and the perfume of Christ in your life today? Oh, my friend, don't be satisfied with this little gimmickry that's going around that's made you a super saint. Why not just get right down where the rubber meets the road? What does Christ mean to you right now? Is there a fragrance, a fragrance of Christ in your life? Now, she knew that he was near, and he said, Lo, I'm with you <laughs> to the very end of the age. And Paul could say in prison, he says, The Lord stood by me, and he'd said, I'll never leave thee, nor forsake thee. You see, the real test now is actually not faith. It's service and sacrifice and gifts. And now he says, You remember to Simon Peter, lovest thou me? And here he's calling upon her. Will you notice the fourth chapter, verse 6? It says, Until the day break and the shadows flee away, I will get me to the mountain of myrrh, to the hill of frankincense. I'm going to get out on the mountainside. I'm going after those sheep that are lost. I'm going to do something for him. May I say to you, that is the important thing. And one day she's in the vineyard and she's working. And when she's working, and I think I should read this. It's found in the second chapter, verse 15. Take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines for our vines of tender grapes. She's sort of fixing the vines so the little foxes couldn't get to them. She had to lift them up. And if you're acquainted with that land, you know that they raised the Grapes right down on the ground. They just put a rock under the vine. They don't string them up as they do in this country. And so she's lifting them up so the little foxes won't get the grapes. And down the road, there comes this pillar of smoke. Who is this that cometh out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense with all powders of the merchant? Well, the cries passed along. Behold, King Solomon is coming. But well, she's busy, and she doesn't know King Solomon. And someone comes to her excitedly and says to her, says, Oh, King Solomon is asking for you. And she says, asking for me. I don't know King Solomon. <laughs> I never met him. Why would he ask for me? And listen to verse 8 of chapter 2. The voice of my beloved, behold, he cometh. Leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a rower, young heart. Behold, he standeth behind our wall. He looketh forth at the windows, showing himself through the lattice. My beloved spoke and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. And so she's brought into the presence of King Solomon. And do you know who King Solomon is? What's her shepherd? <laughs> And he's come for her. You see, my sheep hear my voice. I know them. And they follow me. 
and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven, a shout the voice of the archangel, trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And she goes on, because the great tribulation is coming. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, the time of the singing of birds is come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree putteth forth her green figs, and the vines with the tender grapes give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. One of these days, he's going to call us out of this world. By the way, how much are you involved in the world? Would it break your heart if he came even right now and took us all out? I have a feeling some people are so satisfied down here and are doing so well down here in this affluent society that if he should come, they'd go all the way to heaven crying, all the way crying. That would be their experience because they got so much here. He says, Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. O oh, my dove, thou art in the clefts of the rock. That's where he's put us, in the cleft of the rock, until the storm passes over. In the secret of the stairs, let me see thy countenance. Let me hear thy voice, for sweet is thy voice, and thy countenance is comely. What a glorious thing. And then where we began today, he brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Salvation is a love affair. We love him because he first loved us. And that's what this little book is telling. Now we come to the text of the Song of Solomon. And it is the belief of a great many that what you have here are five marvelous, wonderful canticles, that is, songs, brief songs. And they depict the experience and the story that we told last time of this Shulamite girl, a country girl up in the hill country. And a shepherd one day came by, and she fell in love with him, and he fell in love with her. He promised to return didn't return as soon as she thought, but one day it was announced King Solomon had arrived and wanted to see her. She couldn't believe it. And when she was brought into his presence, she recognized the shepherd. And then the scene here in the Song of Solomon will shift. It'll be up in the Shulamites' country, up in the hill country of Ephraim, and then back down to Jerusalem. And actually, I personally do not feel like that you have a connected story told in the sequence here. Yet it is the belief of a great many that you do. And the thing that we're concerned about here is the application of it for you and me today as believers, actually for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe that it has actually a wonderful application there. And there are five songs that are here. You remember it says back in 1 Kings 4.32 that Solomon wrote 3,000 Proverbs. Well, we have 915 of them. We have very few of them. And that he wrote 1,005 songs. Well, he was really sort of a coal porter of his day. And very frankly, we have probably five of them here. And I think that's the reason that odd number five has been given to us here, you'd think it'd be a round number of a thousand, but a thousand and five. We only have five, so we have really fewer of his songs than we have of his Proverbs. And you find here that it's a wonderful song of marital love. It rebukes asceticism, and it also condemns lust and unfaithfulness to the marriage vow. And it's not a soap opera that we're looking at here. It's not a cheap play where the heroes are neurotic, the heroines are erotic, and the plots are 
Tommy Roddick. What we have here is a thing of beauty, and I hope I can just open the door and give you just a little look into this one. Now, this first song here, we find the bride and the bridegroom. They've been brought together in a wonderful relationship, and it opens like this. The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. Now, this is a song of songs. When you put these five together, these canticles, five of them together, you have this glorious, wonderful story. I suppose that you could compare it to folk music, only I don't think you'd be using a guitar with it. I think this would be in the nature of opera. And this is one of the ways that God had of speaking to his people. The Song of Songs, which is Solomon. Now, notice how it opens like this. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. Now, friends, the kiss was in that day the pledge of peace. And it was a prayer and a token for peace. And after all, Solomon, his name means peace. He's the prince of peace. And he ruled in Jerusalem, the city of peace. And the Shulamite girl here, she's the daughter of peace. And so actually, what you have here is this very personal, close relationship that existed. And it's the Lord Jesus now able to communicate to his people, to the church today, and to communicate to you and me personally his message And very frankly, there needs to be a return to the Word of God. Not just these Bible classes where you learn a few of the mechanics of it and all this gimmickry, and not even just the memorization of it, but that which brings us into a personal relationship with Him where He communicates to us, where He speaks to us here. Let Him kiss me with the kisses of His mouth. He's spoken peace to us, you see. And he alone can speak peace to the human heart today. Now, actually, back in the Old Testament, no one could have done that. Moses, he represents the law, and he spoke. And Aaron represents the priests. And David represents the kings. Uh, Moses, the law, and the prophets. But after all, Moses was slow of speech. That's what he said himself. And Isaiah the prophet, he said his lips were unclean. And Jeremiah said he couldn't speak because he's a child. And all the prophets are dumb. All are not really able to communicate as the Lord Jesus can communicate. Himself, of whom they speak, let him speak for himself, said Bernard one who had drawn very close to Christ. Does Christ communicate to you today in his word? Does he say anything to you today? Oh, Christian friend, you and I need to come in where we can say, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. How very personal, how very wonderful this is. And actually, the one now that has heard his voice And he said, you remember, let him that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And if you have the blood-tipped ear today, and you've heard him speak peace to you, peace through the blood of his cross, forgiveness of sins for you, and you've heard that, now you can take the next step. The one that's been reconciled now to God through the redemption that we have in Christ, he actually entreats the kiss of the solemn nuptial contract. This is that which seals the marriage vow. It's been my custom, I think it's the custom of all ministers, that after you perform the marriage ceremony and the fellow said, I will or I do, and sometimes they say, I wilt, but that's not nice to say that. But I remember that one preacher said, wilt you? And he said, I wilt. And some of them do that, too. But when they both have said, I will or I do, then I always say, then lift the veil and 
give the marriage kiss. That seals the vow, you see. It's a solemn thing, actually. It seals the marriage covenant. And in redemption now, he not only gives us deliverance, but freedom. (laughs) If the Son make you free, you shall be free indeed. But what kind of freedom? Freedom now to come to him and say, I present my body, a living sacrifice unto you. Therefore, not only freedom, but a dedication. And not only that, but brought into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, our Savior. What a lovely, beautiful thing this is that we have here. And let me say to you, are you a child of God? Then, my trembling soul, may I say to you, do you have a fear not to lay hold of his grace? He wants you to. We saw back in Ephesians, he's rich in mercy. And he is rich in grace, oh, the riches of his grace and the riches of his glory. And he wants to share those with you. I don't know about you, I need his mercy, I need his grace. And that was his invitation. He says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll rest you. Do you know what it is to rest? A real rest, not just one Sabbath day, but seven days a week to rest in him and his finished redemption. Now he says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. And you're going to find rest now for your souls. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Now, this is being yoked up with him. And when you're yoked up with him, what a wonderful, glorious relationship is. And he is the one that carries the load for you. How beautiful, how lovely. How wonderful this is. And here we have Erskine's little statement. His mouth the joy of heaven reveals. His kisses from above are pardons, promises, and seals of everlasting love. And then he goes on to say here, For thy love is better than wine. Now, That was used in that day as the expression of the highest of the luxuries that this earth offered. It was a champagne dinner, and it meant that you had everything from soup to nuts. And here he speaks, therefore, of that which is the very highest, that which brings joy to your heart. And you will recall that he made this statement through Paul. He says, Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And he's saying here, Oh, that the Spirit of God might draw us closer to him, you see, and give us that excitement, that exhilaration, oh, that ecstasy of belonging to Christ and of having fellowship with him. Friends, am I talking to you about something that you and I together don't know very much about, do we? Oh, all of this childish stuff today. We play at church. We talk about we're dedicated Christians because we're busy as termites and are having about the same effect. Oh, to get to the place, in whom though now we see him not yet believing, we rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Oh, what a wonderful picture this is of him. And Habakkuk put it like this. He says, Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither fruit shall be in the vine, the labor of the olive shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Oh, my friend, have we arrived to that? And no wonder... He says here, thy love, it's better than wine. (laughs) And I do not mean to be irreverent, but you want to get a kick out of life? This is the way to get a kick out of life. Wine is excess. You'll become an alcoholic. And it'll give you a lift, I grant. But why not let the Spirit of God come into your life? Now, this is the love of God for us today that's shed in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And that's the reason we need the Holy Spirit. Now he goes on to say, 
Because of the savor of thy good ointments, thy name is as ointment poured forth, therefore do the virgins love thee. Now, the ointments here, the perfume. And isn't it wonderful? He began his life with the myrrh brought to him at his birth, and then they brought myrrh to him at his death. It speaks of his death for you and me today. And the sweetness and the fragrance of the life of Christ is wonderful. Oh, but the fragrance of his love for us when he died for us upon the cross. Now, I want you to notice verse 4. Draw me, we will run after thee. The king hath brought me into his chambers. We'll be glad and rejoice in thee, and we'll remember thy love more than wine. The upright love thee. Now, we come here to this wonderful passage of Scripture where we're to love him. And somebody's going to say, well, I just can't reach that state at all. I can't attain to it. It's too high for me. Well, may I say to you, that's the position I think of all of us here. Draw me. (laughs) We'll run after thee. And that means that we recognize immediately we can't come to this high plane I love the name of Jesus, Bonar said, Emmanuel, Christ the Lord. Like fragrance on the breezes, his name abroad is poet. What does the name of Jesus mean to you? Somebody says, I have never experienced that wonderful relationship. Oh, listen to the bride. She says, draw me. And today the child of God is saying here, draw me. Let him come to me. Let him lift me up and let him bring me to this place because I can't do it myself. I recognize that in me that I can't rise to that level. Therefore, we say, draw me. Quarrels put it like this, but like a block beneath whose burden lies that undiscovered worm that never dies. I have no will to rouse. I have no power to rise. For can the water buried axe implore a hand to raise it or itself restore? And from her sandy depths approach the dry foot shower. So hard's the task for sinful flesh and blood to lend the smallest help to what is good. My God, I cannot move the least degree. I, if I but only those who active be, None should thy glory see, thy glory none should see. Lord, as I am, I have no power at all to hear thy voice or echo to thy call. Give me the power to will, the will to do. O oh, raise me up, and I will strive to go. Draw me, O oh, draw me with thy treble twist that have no power but merely to resist. O oh, lend me strength to do, and then command thy list. What a wonderful thing. He says, my, my power is available to you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And is the cry, the deep cry of your heart, Christian friend, draw me. Lift me up, O oh Lord. Bring me to that exciting place that I ought to be on today. That intimate relationship that we should have with Christ, where there is the excitement and the ecstasy of being brought into his presence by the Spirit of God, and that he be made real to us, how wonderful he is today. And we ought to know him better and be representatives. Now, this had been expressed in such a wonderful way that actually we find that we just can't attain unto it. It's too high for us. And then you read here in verse 4, draw me after thee. Draw me and we'll run after thee. How wonderful it is because immediately the bride recognized she could not attain unto this high level. The whole thought here is that the Spirit of God alone can lift us out of our helplessness. Let him come to me if he will, and when he willeth, he can come. But since he cometh not, I cannot go to him. 
except the Father which hath sent him draw me, or he draw me himself, for he's one with the Father. Therefore, we have to cry out to him. And you remember, he said to his own, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. I went after you. And he's after you today. He says, if any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. We can only rouse ourselves and say, Oh, Lord, draw me. And we need today the Spirit of God. That water of life, if we're going to drink it, is the Spirit of God that will gush up in us. Now, the very interesting thing is, he says, We'll run after thee. Now, this is not just a desire to be drawn because the party is lazy or indolent or indifferent, but the whole thought is the individual is helpless. You and I are helpless. There is the desire. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We want to run after him. We'll run after him. But he'll have to give us legs. He'll have to draw us. He'll have to give us that enablement, that divine enablement that only he alone can do for us. And it is, as the Scripture says, "...lift up then thy hands that hang down, and strengthen thy feeble knees. Fainting soul and lame, arise and run the race set before thee, looking unto Jesus." And thou shalt mount up with wings as eagles. Thou shalt run and not be weary, and shall walk and not faint. The king today hath brought me, we're told here. Draw me, we'll run after thee. And he has to respond to that, because we can't attain to that level. But the king hath brought me into his chambers. And the chambers here, the secret of his presence his pavilion, and the secret of his tabernacle. It's the sanctuary, that sanctuary, the holy place, the secret place, where there is no noise of the crowd or the mob, the place that he's made by him in the cleft of the rock where he can cover us with his hand and commune with us. It's the one that says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you'll open, I'll come in to you. I'll sup with you and you with me. Oh, what wonderful, glorious privilege this is that he talks about. And yet we withdraw and have to cry with Isaiah, Woe is me, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. Mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. But the King now hath brought me into his chamber. He's the one that provided a redemption. He's the one that took the coals from off the altar and touched our lips. He's the one that made the supreme sacrifice. And we'll be glad and rejoice in thee. And today we need a little bit more joy, I think, in the church. We need a little bit more joy in our lives. John says these things... We've written unto you that your joy might be full. And the Lord Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. That you might really live it up. You might have a good time. And let me just ask you the question, how is it going, Christian friend? Are you living it up as a child of God? Are you rejoicing in him? Is he close to you today? Are you close to him? Oh, let's cut out the gimmickry today. Let's quit playing church. Let's quit this business of saying I belong to a little select group and I have had this experience and I've had that. Oh, does he mean something to you today? Is he close to you? The king hath brought me into his chambers. We'll be glad and rejoice in thee. We'll remember thy love more than wine. <laughs> May I say to you, I have a notion, wherever you are, there'll probably be literally millions of people across this country crawl up on a bar stool. And why? Well, if I was in their shape, I'd crawl up there too. 
They need something to face life. Many a man feels like he has to have that to face business. And many a person needs that to face a lonely evening. Life's too much for them. It's too complicated today. But may I say to you, if you're a child of God, you can remember that he loves you. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit that's been given unto us. And he wants to make his love real to you. He wants to manifest his love to you. And it's better than crawling upon a bar stool. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately after that, do you remember what Paul said in Ephesians? This is a nice little review for Ephesians that we had. The thing that he said there was just simply this. He said, be not drunk with wine when it's excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And I'm glad he didn't say singing to yourself, because I can't sing. But you can speak it. You can say it. My friend, would it hurt your church membership right now to just say, praise the Lord. (laughs) Be wonderful if you said it. And if you said it where your family could hear you, They probably would want you to see a psychiatrist. And if you said it in the church today, I know they would lead you out because they'd think something had happened to you. Oh, we need to praise the Lord today. Why? Because of the fact we'll remember thy love more than wine. The upright, they love thee. (laughs) Who are the upright? Well, they're his. They are the ones that said, draw me. He stood them up now, and they're going to run the race. They're looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. That's what it means, friends. The Christian life is a love affair. We love him because he first loved us. And there's no use going on. I mean, just chuck the whole thing today. It's meaningless if you don't love him. He loves you, and he gave himself for you. Now he says, I want your love. That is the important thing. That's the thing that seals it. And you want to find a response? We've had this before in different language. Let me go back to a wonderful psalm. I've had so many letters from people who said, Oh, you went too fast through the psalms. Friends, several wrote like this. It was rather clever. They said, You're driving the Bible bus too fast. Well, may I say to you, I'm staying in the speed limit. We have to, in a five-year program, we got to finish. And I'm thinking of the schedule I'm running on, and I'm sorry that I do have to go over so much wonderful ground, but the important thing is that we do have to follow. Now, back to Psalm 63. O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee, my soul thirsteth for thee. You thirsty for it? If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. You can get a lot of beer, you can get a lot of liquor, but you can't get the water alive unless you come to him. He's the only one that handles it. And if you're thirsty, he says, come. Now, verse 2, to see thy power and thy glory so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Now we've entered the chamber, you see, that he's talking about. Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Oh, friends, let's get these lips busy today. Many folk feel like if they're busy doing something. Well, let's be busy doing something, but busy saying something, too, in the way of praise to him. My lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. You see, we're covering the same ground. We're covering in the Song of Solomon with different language. When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches, because thou hast been my help. Therefore, in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. And the wings were those overspreading wings 
in the tabernacle, I heard of a man that got a lot of laughs, and I'm afraid a great many people become irreverent. We need to be careful about that. I think I need to be. He spoke of the fact that in the psalm, he said, I'll hide thee under my feathers. And he says, now God is a chicken. Oh, my friend, he is. But it's a figure of speech. And that's what he said. The Lord Jesus said, he'd like for you to come and rest underneath that. I don't see anything to ridicule at myself at all, and especially if a man believes the Word of God as this man proposes to do. Now, will you notice, "...because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shed of thy wings will I rejoice." Those wings of the cherubim that covered the mercy seat, You see, you're getting very close to the mercy of God here. My soul followeth hard after thee. Thy right hand upholdeth me. And we just can't long after him unless he gives us the desire. But those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sower. They shall be a portion for foxes. But the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone that sweareth by him shall glory. But the mouth of them that speak lies shall be stopped. Well, what a picture. What a glorious picture. That is the 63rd Psalm. Now, let me come back to this very wonderful passage that we have here. Now, we have in verse 5, I am black but comely. O ye daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Kedar, as the curtains of Solomon. I'm told that the tents of Kedar were made of the skin of the black sheep or the black goats. Now, in that land today, you see many of these nomads that have black tents. Now, what he's speaking of here is... We're not talking about a racial characteristic here at all. And I think we need to recognize that. The thought here is in verse 6, "...look not upon me, because I'm black, because the Son hath looked upon me. My mother's children were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but mine own vineyard have I not kept." Now, I looked at that verse the other day in a little different way, and we're going to look at it now. What we have here is this matter of being sunburned. And the interesting thing is we're told that the skin can take all of the rays of the sun with the exception of these ultraviolet rays, and they are the ones that burn our skin today. And sometimes those rays come through the clouds and we are sunburned when we do not know it. I have a cancer condition, as many of you know. And my doctor, he warns me about this above everything else. Don't get in the sun. And even on a cloudy day, be very careful. Keep your head covered. Why? Because the skin can't take that kind of a ray. It will burn and it will cause cancer. Now, a great many people think they can come into the holy presence of God. Well, you and I can't come in the holy presence of God unless we've got a covering. And that covering is the righteousness of Christ. And again and again, you hear of that covering that's mentioned in the Word of God. He's covered me with his wings. That's for protection. And even it's a protection from himself. You and I need to be clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Now, this girl is Shulamite, servant girl. Her family were tenant farmers on one of the vineyards of Solomon. And we find that she's sunburned. And that is the picture that's given to us of her here. And it's not a question of a race here at all. And I know that there's some that make a great deal of that. But that is not it at all. Though she's sunburned, she speaks of the fact that though the sun has looked upon her, that she is black but beautiful. And black is beautiful, we've heard today, and it certainly can be. But the important thing is not the pigment of the skin. The thing is the condition of the heart. And I know a great many. I was telling a group of people up in the Northwest the other day 
about what a wonderful group of Christians we have down in the school here at the Bible Training School. And I said, there's not a Christian group anywhere that I like to be with any more than that group. Wonderful Christians. And you know why? Their hearts are white. And I know a lot of folk that have got a white skin and the blackest heart that you've ever seen. And I don't care about being a them. I guess I am a little segregated. I want to be with God's children. And the picture here is the fact that she's sunburned. She's been outside. And her mother's children were angry with her. And they made her the keeper of the vineyards. But she says, mine own vineyard have I not kept. And this is a picture now of the bride's portrait of herself. Although she has a natural beauty, she has nothing that would commend her because she says that she hasn't been able to take care of her own beauty, which actually means her own self. She hasn't been able to go to the beauty parlor and get a, you know, a hair done up, however they do it. And she hasn't been able to get a facial. And she hasn't been able to get whatever it would take to make a woman beautiful. And that part has been left off because she's been made to work so hard. Now, man in the presence of God is not beautiful. If you think that sometimes that the reason God is interested in us is because we are such nice, sweet little children, you're wrong. (laughs) We are ugly. Oh, are we ugly. And... I want to tell you, we're sunburned. We are not attractive to him at all. And yet, he sees us. And he says that he's going to make his bride beautiful. That is the very wonderful picture. You remember that he gives. He says, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ. Love the church. And he gave himself for the church. Why? Well, in order that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word, he's going to take us to the beauty parlor. And some of us need it. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Now, that's the reason that we hear this statement. Tell me, O thou whom my soul loveth, where thou feedest, where thou makest thy flock to rest at noon. For why should I be as one that turneth aside by the flocks of thy companions? Now, this is this Shulamite speaking to the shepherd that she's just met. And he says now, If thou know not, O thou fairest among women. She says, I'm sunburned, and I haven't been able to go to the beauty parlor. But he says, you're beautiful. Why? Because he's redeemed us. He's paid a price for us. Go thy way forth by the footsteps of the flock and feed thy kids beside the shepherd's tents. And he tells her now that she's to be busy. She's not just to be like those women at court that do nothing, that stay out of the sun. The bride today, the church, should be busy out yonder given out the Word of God. Oh, what a picture we have here in these lovely verses that can be misconstrued by some, you see. We are in a precious section of the Word of God, and we're going to see the glorious, wonderful, personal, intimate relationship of Christ and the church, and Christ and the believer, by the way. Now, let me drop back today and just tie some strings together. You will recall that this girl, a Cinderella, who had been forced out to keep the vineyards and do the outdoor work and even to take care of the sheep. And while she was watching over the sheep, there came a shepherd, an unusual shepherd. He didn't seem to have any sheep. And she raises a question concerning that. And the shepherds seem to be evasive as you read this year. Well, we're going down beneath the surface today and look at something that's precious. Will you note this? She says, verse 7, Tell me, O thou whom my soul loveth, where thou feedest, 
where thou makest thy flock to rest at noon. For why should I be as one that turneth aside by the flocks of thy companions? And the Lord Jesus, you remember, had said, Other sheep I have. And the thing today is that many of us and the church raises questions. And we ask questions, all of us. We want to know about the heathen. Are they lost? We want to know about the doctrine of election. We want to know, what about this man? Is he really saved or isn't he saved? And we're constantly passing judgment on those that are around us. We're always asking about the other sheep. And we ought to recognize that we are the first sheep that we ought to take in consideration, make sure we are sheep. Now, he goes on to say here, In verse 8, he answers, and I think this is the answer of the Lord Jesus to us today. If thou know not, O thou fairest among women, go thy way forth by the footsteps of the flock, and feed thy kids beside the shepherd's tent. Now, first of all, we're to feed the little lambs, and the chances are that we come in under that classification. I think all of us ought to come in under it. As newborn babes, Peter says, desire the sincere milk of the Word. Therefore, we are to feed ourselves today near the shepherd's tent. That's where the grass would be unusually green, by the way. And we need to feed upon the Word of God. And then it speaks of the fact that instead of arguing about these things, and there's so many people that will argue religion, will do nothing about it at all. We have received a superabundance of mail, and it's still dribbling in. After I went over the epistle of the Ephesians, where we talked about the doctrine of election, now I think I've had about a hundred people that have straightened me out. I made the statement that I did not understand the doctrine of election, that there was a great deal I needed to learn about it. Well, I found out that there are just a multitude of people that know all about it, and they were going to help me out. You see, we've got so many folk today that want to argue. They've got the answer. But what the Lord Jesus is saying here is, I want you to feed the sheep. I want you to get out yonder with the sheep and... I want you to get the Word of God out. Instead of arguing about some little point today, why, let's move out. And first of all, we need to recognize that we need to be fed ourselves. I don't think we can feed others and tell about the joy of the Word of God unless it's a joy to us. Herbert put it like this, "'My soul's a shepherd, too, a flock it feeds, of thoughts and words and deeds.'" The pasture is thy word, the streams thy grace, encircling all the place. We need to feed upon the word of God. Then we need to get the word of God out to others, you see. And today, the bride of the Lamb that's to be presented to him someday, the church, is to get the word of God out. And I think, very frankly, we've more or less bogged down in it. And that's coming up again later, and we'll talk about it when we get that. Now, he says, therefore, if you don't know, there are a lot of things you don't have the answer to. I was talking to a young man up north. There's quite a few things he doesn't have the answer to. And I told him this, that I was told as a young preacher because I tried to get the answer to everything at that time, I was told, don't let what you don't know disturb what you do know. Do you know that, well, do you know that Christ died for your sin? Do you know you're trusting him? Are you resting upon him? Now, there are other things that you don't have the answer to. You can't say, I know. I can say, I know that my Redeemer lived it. I know whom I have believed. But I don't find Paul saying anywhere, I know all about the doctrine of election. Now, let's don't let what we don't know disturb what we do know. 
And that's what the shepherd is saying to his bride. He says, don't let worry you about that. You be sure and feed your sheep. You have a responsibility today. There's so many people want to talk to you about, what about the heathen way over yonder in Africa? My friend, what about the folk today in your neighborhood? What about your friends? What about those you contact? Are you getting the Word of God to them? I am grateful today that there is a party bedridden. And I suppose that in her town back in Ohio, that probably a thousand people are contacted each month by her asking them to listen to this radio program. She's a real missionary, let me tell you. And so far, I've never gotten a question from her. I'm sure she doesn't have all the answers, but she just gets out the word today. And that's what the shepherd tells us. He said, if you don't know about these other sheep, then you just keep with your sheep and make sure you get the word of God. Now, will you listen to him as he speaks to the bride? He says, I have compared thee, O my love. Now, as we said before, when the word love is used, it is the bridegroom speaking to the bride. When it's beloved, it is the bride speaking to the bridegroom. I have compared thee, O my love, to a company of horses in Pharaoh's chariots. Now, I suppose that If we had Moses here today and the children of Israel who went down to the Red Sea and found their way blocked there, and they looked back and they saw Pharaoh's chariots coming, well, it was terrible as an army with banners, for that's what it was. And it was very impressive. And actually, he's overwhelmed by the beauty of this country girl, this hillbilly girl. She had none of the graces of the court. She'd never been to a beauty parlor. She had never taken really care of herself. Hers was just a natural beauty, you know. She had had never seen any of these advertisements on TV that you use a certain kind of a hair tonic or a shampoo or a cream or a spray. They've got it today in every form you can think of, in a powder. And you can buy the great big economy size, pour it in your swimming pool and jump in. I tell you, today it's great. But she didn't have that advantage. She had this natural beauty that he saw in her. Now he goes on to say, Thy cheeks are comely with rows of jewel, thy neck with chains of gold. How beautiful this is, and how lovely this is, and how intimate this is. And he says, we'll make thee borders of gold with studs of silver. He said, I intend to cover you with jewelry. I intend to make you quite lovely. And he goes on to speak of her her cheeks and her neck. These are parts of the body that appeal in a love affair. Now, I'm sure that there are many of you today, many of you ladies, you notice the eyelashes of your husband of all things. And you notice his physique. And you husbands, you notice the cheeks and the eyes, even the little ears like a shell. All of that sort of thing, you see. Now, may I say to you, he's speaking of the bride. Now, the bride's the church. And the Lord Jesus Christ, does he find any beauty in the church? Why, my friend, he found us lost sinners, like this girl out yonder, neglected, her hair not taken care of. I imagine a comb hadn't been through her hair for years, but she had a natural beauty. Now, there's nothing in us, actually, that appealed to Christ. This idea today that there must have been something in us. Friend, just believe him when he says, we bring nothing, he provides everything. We are not lovely. When he came down to deliver the children of Israel, he didn't say, you are such superior people to the Egyptians. They weren't. They were inferior. 
He said, you're faithful to me. They were not faithful to him. You are not in idolatry. They were in idolatry. They were faithless. They had deserted God. They had turned their back upon him, and they were engaged in gross immorality. Well, what appeal to God? Why would he waste his time with them? Well, he said to Moses, said, I heard their groaning. <laughs> that appeals to God. Your lost condition today. He loves you. And your lost condition caused him to provide a salvation for him. And then he says, I remember my covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God says, when I say a thing, I intend to make good. And God says, if you don't do anything but trust Christ, you will be saved. My, what a picture that we have here. And this is a glorious picture, may I say, of the church. It's the church as he is going to make her. You remember that is what we're told over in Ephesians. And you remember the thing that he says that Christ also loved the church, and he gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word. You see that he uses the Word of God to sanctify also. It's a miracle soap, by the way. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy without blemish. That is, holy, set apart from him, and without blemish. What's happened? Why, he's redeemed us. He paid a price for us. He has subtracted our sins, but he added his righteousness, and we are covered with the righteousness of Christ and stand complete in him, accepted in the Beloved. Now, let's move on down here. This is very interesting. Here in chapter 1, verse 12, Song of Solomon, it says, "...while the king sitteth at his table, my spikenard sendeth forth the smell thereof." Now, that's a very interesting statement that is made for us here. I think that we probably ought to make a change or two here. "...while the king sitteth at his table." Some have attempted to translate it while he's on his circuit, that is, while he's out going through the kingdom. And some have rendered it while he's at his banquet. And I think that probably the best translation that could be given of this, and that's where all of these new translations seem to me fall so far short, they don't get down to get the spiritual meaning. It's really while the king sitteth at his round table. That's the circuit that's here. And the round table, you see, is where he either sits or reclines with his guests around the banquet table. And you remember that this is the time that he brings in here all of these invited guests. And when he was born, you remember that came these wise men, out of the east, and they brought gifts to him, gold and frankincense and myrrh, and they came there. Then the shepherds came down from the hilltop, and it was Milton who put it like this about the wise men. See how from far upon the eastern road the star-led wizards haste with odors sweet, O run, prevent them with thy humble ode, and lay it lowly at his blessed feet. Have thou the honor first, thy Lord to greet. And so they were the first ones. And David put it like this. He says, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. And this is his round table where he brings in his own. Are you sitting at that table today? You have an invitation. He sent out an invitation to the highways and byways. And there was a little old boy down in southern Oklahoma, a toe-headed fella. Nobody thought even to talk to him. But he got the invitation, and thank God I accepted it. May I say to you, and I've been sitting at his table for a long time long time. And he says today to you, if you're not there, behold, I stand at the door and knock. 
If any man will open the door, I'll come into him, I'll sup with him and he with me. Say, why don't you sit at the round table? Sir Lancelot may sit at King Arthur's round table. That's nothing compared to this round table. And he says here, my spikenard sendeth forth the smell thereof. This is the fragrance of Christ's life, by the way. How wonderful it is. How glorious it is. And this is the fragrance that should be in our lives today by association with him. And I should say, I think the Lord's Supper is a very important service. If it's just a form and ritual with you, well, forget it. I have quite a few letters. A lady from down in Miami, Florida wrote, she said, you know, I'd never heard anyone say that they said to the Lord Jesus, I love you. And she said, I'd never said it, but I loved him. And she said, ever since then, I heard you say that morning and noon and night, I'm making up for lost time. I tell him that I love him. And she said, you know, the word of God has taken on a new color, a new meaning. May I say to you, this is wonderful, the fragrance of it today. And these are things that we need today. Now we have this statement here, and it's quite an intimate statement. Don't be afraid now and run away from it. A bundle of myrrh is my well-beloved unto me. He shall lie all night betwixt my breasts. Now, may I say to you, I think the original here, to let you translate it several different ways, but actually, it shall lie all night betwixt my breasts. What is that? Well, it's this bundle of myrrh. And what is that bundle of myrrh? That's Christ. When he was born, they brought myrrh to him. The wise men did. When he died, Joseph and this man Nicodemus, they brought myrrh and put on his body, and the women brought it. This speaks of, may I say to you, of his birth, his entire life. Speaks of Jesus. And what do you think about at night? May I say to you, he should lie heavy upon your breast and upon your heart at night. When you wake up during the night seasons, what do you think about, friends? Do you begin to worry about the next day and worry about that? Oh, I do a lot of that. But it's wonderful sometimes to just turn that off. And we are hearing a great deal today about, I get letters from these young people. They say, we've turned Jesus on listening to the program. Wonderful. Turn him on at night when you're thinking about these things. Because, again, may I say that that's exactly what Paul was talking about over in the fourth chapter of Philippians when he says, finally, brethren. This is finally. This is something you're to do when you get the end of the rope. Whatsoever things are true, that's Christ. Whatsoever things are honest, that's Christ. Whatsoever things are just, that's the Lord Jesus. Whatsoever things are pure, he's pure. Whatsoever things are good, of good report, or of excellence, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. These are the things. It's to meditate upon the Lord Jesus Christ. It's been put like this, a bundle of mellifluous myrrh is my beloved best to me which I will bind between my breasts while I do rest in silent slumbers. A friend of mine put me on to this years ago. He said, when I go to bed at night, the last thing I do is pull up the covers and I look up and say, Lord Jesus, I love you. And then again, Watts put it like this, as myrrh new bleeding from the tree, such is a dying Christ to me. And while he makes my soul his guest, my bosom, Lord, shall be thy rest. Oh, to think upon the Lord Jesus Christ, how wonderful it is. And again, Erskine put it like this, From this enfolded bundle flies his savor all abroad. Such complicated sweetness lies in my incarnate God. Oh, Christian friend, we're missing so much today. Are you satisfied with these little courses now? 
Are you willing to have some little ritual in your life be the solution? May I say to you, oh, to have him today, to have him today as the very object of your life, the one who brings in the excitement, the ecstasy, and the fellowship, and the joy, and his grace, and his love, and his mercy. It's all yours. Just open the door. He's knocking right now. Even Jesus. Now, we come, friends, to this very interesting verse that we have here. He says, My beloved, and will you notice that, My beloved is unto me as a cluster of camphor in the vineyards of En Gedi. Now, this is oh so lovely. All of this is so lovely and beautiful, poetic, and it speaks of this girl that was keeping the sheep. She's a hillbilly girl, and the shepherd has come, and we've already suggested it'll be Solomon later on. But this also depicts the wonderful relationship between Christ and the church and between Christ and the individual believer who wants to come in close to him and have fellowship with him. Now, she speaks here. My beloved is unto me as a cluster of camphor in the vineyards of En Gedi. Now, the camphor here actually is the cypress. The New Schofield Bible calls it the henna flowers. And actually, the flowers of the cypress are that color. The fact of the matter is, a great deal of study has been made by scholars on the mention here of these different plants, and they grow in profusion, that is, the cypress does, in that land and in Turkey, all through that area. The thing I noticed about Turkey, traveling over the landscape, visiting the ruins of these seven churches and of others there, the thing that impressed me above everything else was these great rows of cypress trees. Now, there's a very interesting statement can be made concerning them, and I'd like to pass that on to you. The cypress is now generally agreed to be the henna of the Arabians. The deep color of the bark, the light green of the foliage, and a softened mixture of white-yellow in the blossoms present a combination as agreeable to the eye as the odor is to the scent. The flowers grow in dense clusters, the grateful fragrance of which is as much appreciated now as in the time of Solomon. The women take great pleasure in these clusters, They hold them in their hand, carry them in their bosom, and keep them in their apartments to perfume the air. And this is Quito's statement concerning now the cypress, and it's well for us to know what we're talking about here. But now will you notice the comparison is made here the bridegroom, and what a lovely thing it is. He is to me as a cluster of camphor in the vineyards of En Gedi. Now... Probably we ought to mention En Gedi. En Gedi is the place, and I visited there. It's down by the Dead Sea. It's one of these wonderful oases in the desert. Springs of that is where David hid from Saul. And if you ask me, it's a good hiding place. I don't think you could find anybody in those barren hills that are around there. But En Gedi itself, And all kinds of lovely spices are grown there. It's quite an interesting place in that desolate desert that is down there. Now, the statement is used that he is camphor in the vineyards of En Gedi. A row of these trees, these lovely trees. Now, will you notice how beautiful it is? It's a fragrance that is common to it and to the myrrh also. Now, Christ, as the beloved, is represented here full of attractive beauty. 
as well as an aromatic fragrance here. And I wonder if those of us today who emphasize the deity of Christ as much as, for instance, as I do on the broadcast, I wonder if maybe sometimes I don't give you a lopsided view of him. Have you ever stopped to think how lovely he was in his person, just his human person when he was down here? He came and took upon himself, you know, our humanity. He was in all points like as we are, tempted as we are, sin apart, no sin in him. And how wonderful he is, how lovely he is, how glorious he is. He wasn't lopsided. You remember in the meal offering, there was well-beaten flour. He wasn't lumpy like most of us are. And I don't mean physically, but psychologically. All of us are off in one way or another, tell the truth. Any psychologist will tell you that. We all have our peculiarities. One man was talking to another and said to him, says, you know, we all have peculiarities. And this man says, well, I don't think so, said. I don't think I have any peculiarities. And the man said to him, says, all right, said, let me ask you a question. Says, do you stir your coffee with your right hand or your left hand? And the fellow thought to him, why? He says, I stir it with my right hand. Well, he says, that's your peculiarity. Says, most people use a spoon. And so we have today, all of us, peculiarities, you see. We may not stir our coffee with our hand, but we've got peculiarities. We're lumpy. He was not. He was the perfect human being. How lovely he was. He is the bundle of camphor, and it's a picture of him as the one that John could look at him and say with, oh, with such enthusiasm and with such expression, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And if you'll hear him, hear in your souls shall live. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And he was a sacrifice, Paul says in Ephesians, a sacrifice of a sweet-smelling savor. He was the burnt offering that ascended up to heaven. And it just speaks of the fact that, as we'll see later, God is satisfied with what Jesus did for you. And he's satisfied with Jesus. He said, this is my beloved son and whom I'm well pleased. He never said that about Vernon McGee. And I have a notion he never said that about you. But he was satisfied with Jesus. And say, are you satisfied with him? Oh, when I see all the activity today in all these different organizations, and all this psychological gimmickry that's being used and all kinds of programs being put in. And we have to introduce this, and we have to have this modern music, and we have to approach everything from some viewpoint. My friend, are you satisfied with Jesus? I don't think people are today. They wouldn't be running here and yon over the face of the earth trying to find satisfaction, some of them going to conferences, some of them running to hear this thing and that thing, something that is new today. And we got all kinds of little organizations and even Bible study. People can get so engrossed in that, they lose sight of the person of Jesus Christ here. How wonderful he is. He's a bundle of camphor. And what a picture we have of him. Everyone that seeth the Son and believeth on him hath everlasting life, hath eternal life. Oh, have you seen him? Do you know him today? And then we're told, let us run the race that's set before us, Christian friend, looking unto Jesus, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And then there's something else here. We find that it's a bundle of camp. What? We have a great emphasis in the Scripture, the oneness of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only begotten Son of the Father. He is the one good shepherd. He's the one true vine. He's the one rose of Sharon. He's the one light of the world. He's the one servant of the Father. He is the one sacrifice for sins. He is the one way, one truth, one life. But in his perfect unity, there is a fullness. 
that is absolutely exhaustless. And may I say to you that he's also a cluster of fragrant flowers. There is the oneness, but oh, in him there is everything. It's a cluster of this one who is the one beloved, the one Christ, the one Son of the living Father and Son of man. Not two clusters, but one. But he has a lot of blossoms, beauteous blossoms, and the fragrance that comes from them. And the innumerable graces crowd harmoniously together in the Lamb of God. While you have in him the faith of Abraham, the persuasiveness of Jacob, the meekness of Moses, the zeal of Elijah, the holiness of Job, the love of John. They're all full and perfect in him. And you find in him truth and righteousness and wisdom and love and pity and friendship and majesty and might and sovereignty and lowliness and patience and faith and zeal and courage and holiness and all the graces and If I've left anything out, it ought to be included too, because he is everything. He is all in all to us. And Christ is ours today. How wonderful it is. And that's the way that the bride is going to respond here, as we're going to see in just a moment. Will you look then at now what the bride says here? It says, My beloved is unto me as a cluster of camphor, in the vineyards of En Gedi. He is the one, the one who's altogether lovely. He is the chiefest among 10,000. We're talking now about Christ, friend. What does he mean to you? Now she says, the bride is responding, Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair, thou hast dove's eyes. I think this is interesting. He speaks to her and tells how wonderful she is. And now she turns right around and says the same thing to him. Thou art fair, my love. Thou art fair, is what he says. And she turns right around and she says, Behold, thou art fair, my beloved. Now, let's look at that for a moment. Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. I mentioned this last time. She's the one that said, I'm black for the sun hath looked on me. Sunburn. And what does he say? He says, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. You see, we've sinned. We've committed iniquity. We've done wickedly. We've rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. That is the confession of every Christian if he's a child of God. And now what has happened is the Lord Jesus could say, I've given them thy word, and they've kept thy word. And that's his pleading for you and me today. And as God would see, no iniquity in Jacob or perverseness in Israel and wouldn't let Balaam criticize him. Oh, he went down and dealt with them. God dealt with him, but he won't let a heathen prophet do that because he sees us today in Christ. Behold, thou art fair, and the secret of the beauty is in this. Thou hast dove's eyes, eyes chaste and constant, for what is it? Why, they have the beauty of the bridegroom, because they have their eyes fixed upon him, and all the beauty is derived. Why, if the eye be single, you remember, the whole body is full of light. And full thereof also of beauty. For if the eye be double, the body is full of darkness. And we need to keep our eye on him. And the Lord Jesus laid it on the line. He said, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. You've got your eye fixed upon the Lord Jesus. Oh, I get tired of all these dedicated Christians that are as lazy as they can be. I've been in many conferences I hear a great deal about dedication. As a friend said to me that makes the rounds about like I do of these different groups, he says it's interesting where they're always talking about dedication and that they want to manifest Christ. You get the sorriest service. Man, they're lousy, if you ask me. That's not a good word, but it's not good what they're doing. But they're always talking about 
how dedicated they are, and they want to serve the Lord, and they're lazy as they can be. My friend, you don't talk about it. <laughs> you reveal it, and you reveal your love to him. By, it must be manifested in your life. Thou art fair, my beloved. Now, the bridegroom is to those of us who believe he's everywhere. He's beautiful. He's no superstar. He is altogether lovely. And he's fair in heaven, and he's fair. Oh, thou art fair, my beloved. He's fair in heaven. He was fair on earth. He was fair when he was in a virgin's womb. He was that holy thing. He was fair in the arms of his parents. He was fair in the miracles he performed. Fair in the stripes he bore. He was fair when calling upon life. Fair when disregarding death. Fair in laying down his life for you and me. Fair in receiving it again. Fair on the cross. Fair in the sepulcher. Augustine said that. And he's pleasant. You know, the word is used to describe the wonderful melodies of the sanctuary. Sing praises to him because it is pleasant. That which is pleasant. He's pleasant. He's lovely. Why would people run away from Jesus Christ? He's so wonderful, so lovely. Behold how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity and the agreeableness of a chosen earthly friend closer than a brother. Very pleasant hast thou been unto me, O Jonathan. That's what David said of Jonathan. What can you and I say of the greater than Jonathan, our Jonathan, our Jesus? Can you say he's pleasant? sweet to be with him, wonderful to be with him. He is the one that can bring rest to us. Are you satisfied today with Jesus? God is. Now, he says also our bed is green. Well, actually, it is the reclining couch where they sat around the banquet or the couch that the king would sit upon. And I think it's a picture of the banquet couch here. And it was always strewn with flowers and green leaves as for a marriage feast. And what a beautiful picture it is. Now, I very frankly think that it could be the green grass where the sheep were, that that was the place where they were sitting. They were reclining there. It could be in the palace in Jerusalem. I don't know. All I know is that what we have here is this glorious Wonderful picture. And here is where she talks to the shepherd about the sheep. Here is where she can commune with him. And there's communication. And David put it like this, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. And when a sheep lies down in green pastures, he's full. He's had enough. And he always makes us lie down in green pastures, you see. What a beautiful picture this is, and what a lovely picture it is. Oh, to come and rest, and that's his invitation. Come and rest, he says, those that are heavy laden. Are you tired? Are you weary? Christian friend, rest in him. As someone has put it, heavy laden and hopeless thou art, seeking peace afar off and passing him who is near. Like Hagar in the desert, with the last drop drained from the now shriveled water skin, thou art ready to lie down and die. But open thine ears, and thou wilt hear one say, Come unto me, and I'll rest you. Open thine eyes, and thou wilt see the well and the green sward around it. And with a full heart thou wilt answer him, Behold, thou art pleasant. Also, our couch is green. What a picture. What a beautiful picture. And you remember where he reclined. When he first came to this earth, they put him in a manger. And the last place they put him was in that tomb of Joseph. May I say to you, he went to that place that you and I might sit down with him in green pastures. What a picture we have here, friends.